Hello and welcome to the second of our series of conversations on constitutional governance in Sri Lanka. I have with me today Dr. Asanga Valikala, the director of the Edinburgh Centre for Constitutional Law. Hello, Dr. Asanga Valikala. Hello, Royal. Nice to see you. Yes, you too. Okay, so let's start with uh, talking about uh, why resolving the economic crisis also requires constitutional and governance reforms because most people would see what's needed for the economic recovery of Sri Lanka as purely matters of economics. Yeah. Um, so why does this need sort of wider policy changes and reforms? Why would you say it has a wider constitutional and governance dimensions? Absolutely, because uh, an, an economy does not exist in a vacuum. It exists within a political culture, it exists within a framework of government, right? So if something is going right with the economy, it is because we are getting the governance arrangements right. Right? The decision-making processes for of on, on the economy are doing very well if you are getting the economy right. Likewise, if you, if you are going into bad economic decision-making, resulting in almost this catastrophic situation that we have ended up today, that clearly points to the fact that our decision-making processes, that is the structures of government in place that we have for the management and for the development and growth of the economy, there's something very, very wrong with them. Right. Right? So I would argue very strongly that Whenever a, a country hits uh, an economic crisis of the proportions that Sri Lanka is in right now, there is always behind that a, a governance reason also, also for that. Right. And we need to be very, very clear that the response to this and our recovery, if it is going to be durable, sustainable and long term, that we have to address our minds not merely to the economic uh, response, the economic policy response, the macroeconomic response, but also the governance and constitutional uh, underpinnings to that, that we really have to get right uh, in order both for our recovery to be uh, durable and sustainable, but also that in some time in the future that we don't end up in this situation all over again. So what specifically about the 78 constitution has led, in your opinion, to this current situation? I will answer that question as a short and long answer. Okay. The short answer is the, the executive presidential system that, that the 78 constitution ha in introduced in 1978. Mm. Uh, and, the, and the issue with that is what I would call over-centralization, right? And the flip side of over-centralization over is accountability. When you have uh, the system of government which is based on a very uh, unaccountable, unchecked, unbalanced executive presidential system where once you have elected a person to that office, uh, within the executive, uh, the, the checks that can uh, be there if in, the, in, the, in the form of a prime minister and cabinet don't really work very much. Parliament has very much become an appendage of the executive. Mm. Um, the judiciary is notionally independent, but we know very well that there's a very strong president, possibly governing with a very strong parliamentary majority. The judiciary doesn't sort of interfere too much, mm. right? Um, except in exceptional situations. Overall, therefore, what we have with the 78 constitution is a system of government that is unchecked, unbalanced, uh, over-centralized, and therefore the consequences of that is that accountability suffers. Right. And when accountability suffers, transparency suffers, right? When transparency is not there, corruption thrives, mm. authoritarianism stri thrives, and that is just bad governance. Mm. And bad governance leads ultimately to, uh, as we have seen in the past, uh, bad policies that led to civil war and ethnic conflict, bad policies that led to alienation of the southern youth and insurrections and then the, and the authoritarian and violent response from the state because the state that is over, in, over centralized only knows how to behave in that way. Mm. They don't know how to behave in a way that takes uh, the, the citizenry of a d democracy seriously be responsive to their needs. Right? They, they think that the, the state becomes an entity that is autonomous from, from the populace, from, mm. the, the, from the polity as a whole. Mm. And likewise with the current situation. Right. <coughs> we began this, remember, the, the immediate part, the proximate part to this began with the election of Gautabir Rajapaksa in uh, 2019, uh, who was very, very clear what he was going to do, right? That he, he, the whole campaign was based around him himself being this sort of mm. great technocrat mm. uh, who would know how to make you know, strong decisions, mm. uh, govern with the military and, 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 and other technocratic advisors. And that was what Unfortunately, the people of Sri Lanka in 2019, erroneously in my view, mm. endorsed and gave him a mandate to do. Right. Two and a half years later, he has led the country to complete collapse. Right. So this over-centralization of power that we almost in our political culture intuitively think is a good idea because you, that, you, that you need a strong guy 
uh, unhindered by checks and balances to deliver uh, the, the economic aspirations of the people. That is a completely wrong idea that we must, after this crisis, uh, entirely unlearn as a, as a country, hmm. as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a citizenry. By contrast, when you have a system of government that is checked, balanced, and is accountable, there is you, you lessen the scope for wrong and incompetent or corrupt decision making, with the result that you minimize the scope for crises happening. So what's interesting is what you said that even if the populace erroneously voted for Rajapaksa, it's clear that they want clean government. They thought he would deliver it, he didn't, but what they want is that sort of thing. So at a time like this, if we can bring in the reforms, then you can give people what they want, mm -hmm. right? So if I were to, talk, aside from the constitution uh, itself, in your opinion, do you think there are other elements um, of culture and say institutions of government that also contributed to this crisis? Yes. Political culture is a very important thing and we need to unpack what, it, what we mean by that. Uh, in our country, we've had a democracy, of what is called electoral democracy, right, uh, since 1931. That's a very long-standing democracy, and it has been uh, uninterrupted. That is an achievement, right? We've we've uh, we've had authoritarian leaders who will do things with things like presidentialism, try to sort of ensure that you have a system of government that is unaccountable. But one thing that we have never done is to try to abolish elections, right, mm. in this country. Mm. So that's on one level an achievement, but yet we must remember that electoral democracy, that is to say, having periodic elections is not the end all of, of the democratic form of government. Right? Political culture is very important because there are other values associated with the democratic way of life. Integrity, the lack of corruption, uh, that government behaves in the public interest rather than the interests of a few, right? Uh, like in the past that we have just, uh, recent past that we have seen that there is this a family, uh, its outgrowths, and then there's a sort of business community around it, and we saw that the economic decision making became concentrated in the interest mm. in their interest rather than in the national or the public interest. So democracy inc includes all of these things: um, the fact that there is accountability, that the, the that, that there is uh, responsiveness, all of these things. So a political culture is the bottom-up way in which democracy functions. The constitution is there to frame the rules of the game, right. right, and to tell us the procedures for the formation and the dismissal of governments and all of these kinds of things. But political culture is important. And, and what, in this country, one of the problems that we have, even though the idea of elections and participating very heavily in elections, we always have very hyper turnouts mm -hmm. and all of that mm -hmm. kind of thing, is ingrained. We have to look at the other side and also self-critically look at ourselves, right? right? We, because we have also mandated these things, like in the way that we did in 2019 with Gotabe Rajapaksa, uh, who did not come in a coup, he was elected, yeah. right? He got a mandate to do what he, the strongman politics. Yeah. So what is it about our political culture that desires this, that mandates this, that asks for this stuff, right? Almost to be whipped. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it is the it is it is the technical term sometimes is called personalism, okay. right? And what that means simply is that we our you know, our understanding of political power, our understanding of government is all about personalities. So there is occasionally there's a Jaya Jaya that comes along, there's a Chandrika that comes along, and there's a Mahindra Rajapaksa that comes along, and we place all our hopes and dreams on this man, and giving him over centralized excessive powers a man or woman, and expecting them to do, uh, deliver heaven on earth to us, yeah. right? That is a major problem. What happens with personalism is that, A, that person can never, no person can ever deliver the expectations, right? So you, it inevitably leads to disillusionment. Secondly, when you encourage a political class or professional politicians uh, to behave in a personalist way, what that tells you is, I have, I have got a mandate from the people. So laws don't matter, institutions don't matter, checks and balances don't matter. I will do that for the people, right? right. It is also the sort of, you know, the, 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 the dynamics of populist politics. Mm. This is not the way to go, right? If you want to get out of this crisis in a way that we ensure that there is no f future crisis for, for future generations, we have to unlearn these aspects of our political culture. Um, these ideas of uh, of the of the messiah, the 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 the, the guy who comes and delivers, uh, you know, for us, uh, and we have no interest in that guy behaving in a way that it conforms to the rule of law and to the constitution. 
we are very happy to go along with him behaving in corrupt and authoritarian ways. And we have to remember, well, we have con consistently been disappointed by every president that has been elected under the 1978 constitution. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, on the one hand, of course, the faults of that individual, but it's also because that individual has never ever come uh, without a, uh, a democratic mandate of one sort or the other. Now we have, for the first time, uh, mm. a president elected by parliament, but all previous presidents have been directly elected. We have to remember that we have to give our democratic mandate at an election to political parties to exercise power on our behalf in a way that works in the national interest. And the only way that can happen is if we also insist that that power is checked, balanced, and constrained. Right. Right? So <clears throat> this personalism that we have in our political culture, I don't know how you can change political culture except that uh, electric maturing and understanding this itself. Mm. And I saw, I think, signs of that happening in Daragale. I think yeah. you would have yourself seen yeah. um, that people were beginning to get the difference between client voters and democratic citizens. Right. right? You're just not there to deliver a vote and expect a, a transactional you know, mm -hmm. benefit in return from your politician. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the wrong understanding of democracy. If you're a citizen, you expect that person, you, they're, they're a servant, you're put there, you're, we, we taxpayers pay for their salaries, you're there to do a job, yeah. right? And they're, you're to, they're there to do a job under the contract known as the Constitution. So unless we begin right, to change our voting patterns, mm -hmm. how we think about politics, how we, the, the, the kind of politician that we want in our institutions, then um, we're stuck with this. We are stuck with this. So in the present context, how do we begin a public conversation that can bring about these changes? I think there are several elements to that, right? I, as I mentioned in my previous answer, there is a sort of demand and supply side to this, right? Yeah. So the, the demand side, of course, is, is, is the fact that Aragale has shown how delegitimized and uh, the lack of credibility of the political class of mm -hmm. parliament, the man who was president, all of these kinds of things. And we have to start thinking about the way that we change that. Mm -hmm. uh, for 40, 50 years at least, at least since the 1970s, the middle class has withdrawn from the activity of politics. Right? They have, they have not, never encouraged their children to go into politics. Mm -hmm. It's a dirty game, don't mm -hmm. do this. You're better in the private sector, go abroad, Correct. all these things. And these have now come to bite us. Mm -hmm. Right, so when, when, when that happens, uh, you can't be surprised about the quality of, of, of people who are in politics and then are elected into politics and, and then the way that they do things. But they are also part of our culture, I don't want to exclude any, anyone. But we, what we need to do from the demand side, so to speak, is that we have to think of ways at the next election to at least infuse uh, some degree of, of difference to the, to the the caliber and the class of individuals that we um, uh, have at, as, as professional politicians. And don't get me wrong, this is not some elitist argument talking about English-speaking Colombo elites or anything like that. There are perfectly decent uh, singular speakers and Tamil speakers who are out there but are unable to because of our current political yeah. structure. And also the values be, you were talking about. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's the values that yeah. we're talking about. The supply side is the culture side. Um, there were some very encouraging signs, I think, uh, during the Aragale that we understood finally, we f understood finally this relationship between uh, over-centralized personalist government and, and, and how it leads to bad decision making and, and, and eco economic crisis. Um, that we need to step up as citizens, that we have a responsibility. We don't have only have rights that we go to the Supreme Court with once in a while to, you know, through mm. fundamental rights. Yeah. But we also have responsibilities as mm. citizens of, of, of a democracy to, you know, to think about um, how we participate uh, in the public life of our country, right? And not everybody wants to get into politics. Correct. But everybody can vote responsibly, yeah. right? And at the very least, we need to be able to uh, not vote for people who are criminal convicts, right? Who are manifestly corrupt. Mm. Uh, people who are accused of uh, or, or have a track record of authoritarian government. If you continue to re mandate these people in con successive elections, you're setting yourself up for abuse, mm. right? It's abusive governance. Um, it's very much like abuse in, 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 in the private sphere. So we have to understand that we have a responsibility and we have an opportunity to step up to the mark, to rethink our uh, 
uh, our, our role as individuals and as citizens in a democracy and that we have we can actually do something about it right and one of the very hopeful things I see is that I don't think we are going to see this immediately but it's a long-term historic sort of demographic shift that we are beginning to see in Sri Lanka from about um, uh, the 2015 election onwards nobody thought the 2015 January change was possible yeah. but it did happen yeah. and when you look a little closely and analyze the 50% plus majority that actually voted out Mahindra Rajapaksa in favor of uh, Yahapalani, a reformist mm. democratizing agenda. Not necessarily for Sirisena, yeah. but for that agenda. Yeah. Right? Um, and then subsequently as well, you're beginning to see, notwithstanding the sort of aberration of 2019 and, and 2020, uh, you're beginning to see that the electorate is changing. Right. right? That the 18 to 35 or so, you know, um, young electorate uh, is beginning to play a much greater role. Um, and, and what is the nature of this uh, electorate? This is not a sudden expansion of Colombo liberals to become a democratic majority in the, mm. in, in the country. Uh, it's people who, whose backgrounds are certainly not from uh, elite ones, mm. uh, from provincial ones, from you know all of that. Uh, with parents who, have, who are locally ed educated, all of these, but who have worked hard um, to uh, bring these children up. Um, to speak in English, to uh, be educated in English, who have probably gone abroad mm -hmm. uh, for a bit at least. Uh, they have come back and of course this is the social media age mm, when okay. they have far much more information yeah. at their fingertips than yeah. any other generation did before. Yeah. They know what is happening in the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, and they're less excited and can be, can be less led by crude appeals to ethnicity mm. or religion or all of these things that have been the way that uh, political parties and leaders in the past have been able to cover up authoritarianism and corruption and you just you know go put the priests in front put the temple in front and everything is sorted out okay. right that is going to be less and less and less possible for the political entrepreneur to do um, so i um, i think we can be a little optimistic that the electorate is changing in this direction and that when the younger that that, that demographic expands uh, that we will have, a, 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 quite frankly, a better class of citizen, mm. right? Rather than simply a, a, a voter who exchanges mm. uh, their vote for something in return kind of thing. Um, who will expect a little bit more from government, right? And again, as I said, it's important not to overstate all of these kinds of things and sort of superimpose our own sort of ideological kind of preferences onto, onto what's happening. Mm. Um, uh, particularly, you know, to, to sort of think that, okay, Sri Lanka is going to become sort of political, uh, liberal democracy, uh, you know, uh, so in short order, probably not. Yeah. But it will certainly become more democratic. Right. Yeah. Because the, because the expectations of polit politicians, of politicians, by the electorate, by the citizenry, is going to change. Right. And that may, over time, sort of also change the culture. Right. I mean, this is very encouraging, not just the hope that you have, but also the fact that people, many people do uh, see the problems, but they don't see the solutions. And you very clearly, I think, encapsulated the so solutions that can be brought about to change the political culture and in time change mm -hmm. uh, the country. So thank you very much for this conversation, Dr. Valikala, and I will see you soon. Thank you.